Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before addressing the issues raised in the Iraq Inquiry report, I would like to remember and honour the 179 British servicemen and women who were killed, and the thousands maimed and injured during the Iraq War and their families, as well as the hundreds of thousands of Iraqis who have died as a result of the invasion and occupation launched by the US and British governments 13 years ago. Yesterday, I had a private meeting with some of the families of the British dead, as I've continued to do over the past dozen years. It's always a humbling experience to witness the resolve and resilience of those families and their unwavering commitment to seek truth and justice for, they, for those that they lost in Iraq. They have waited seven years for Sir John Chilcott's report. It was right that the inquiry heard evidence from such a wide range of people and that the origins, conduct and aftermath of the war should have been examined in such detail. But the extraordinary length of time it has taken to see the light of day is, frankly, clearly a matter for regret. I should add that the scale of the report, running to 6,275 pages, to which I was only given access at 8 o'clock this morning, means that today's response, by all of us, can only be a provisional one. Mr Speaker, the decision to invade and occupy Iraq in March 2003 was the most significant foreign policy decision taken by a British government in modern times. It divided this House and set the government of the day against the majority of the British people, as well as against the weight of global opinion. The war was not in any way, as Sir John Chilcott says, a last resort. Frankly, it was an act of military aggression launched on a false pretext as the inquiry accepts and has long been regarded as illegal by the overwhelming weight of international legal opinion. It led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people and the displacement of millions of refugees. It devastated Iraq's infrastructure and society. The occupation fostered a lethal sectarianism as the report indicates, that turned into a civil war. Instead of protecting security at home or abroad, the war fueled and spread terrorism across the region. To the Sunday's suicide bo uh, bomb attack in Baghdad, which killed over 250 people, the deadliest so far, was carried out by a group whose origins lie in the aftermath of the invasion. By any measure, the invasion and occupation of Iraq has been for many, a catastrophe. Mr Speaker, the decision to invade Iraq in 2003 on the basis of what the Chilcot report calls, and I quote, flawed intelligence about the weapons of mass destruction has had a far-reaching impact on us all. It's led to a fundamental breakdown in trust in politics and in our institutions of government. The tragedy is that while the governing class got it so horrifically wrong, Many people, many of our people, actually got it right. Many, on February the 15th, 2003, one and a half million, spanning the entire political spectrum, and tens of millions of other people across the world, marched against the impending war. The biggest ever demonstration in British history. It wasn't, Mr Speaker, that those of us who opposed the war, it wasn't that those of us who opposed the war underestimated the brutality or the crimes of Saddam Hussein's dictatorship. Indeed, many of us campaigned against the Iraqi regime during its most bloody period, when the British government and the US administration were actually supporting that regime, as was confirmed by the 1996 Scott inquiry. But we could see this state, broken by sanctions and war, posed no military threat, and the WMD evidence was flimsy and confected, that going to war without United Nations authorization was profoundly dangerous, that foreign invasion and occupation would be resisted by force, and they would set off a series of uncontrollable and destructive events. If only this House had been able to listen to the wisdom 
of many of our own people when it voted on the 18th of March against waiting for a UN authorization for a second resolution, the course of events might have been different. All but 16 of the members of the official opposition at that time supported the war, whilst many in my party voted against it, as did others in other opposition parties. There are members here today on all benches, including dozens of my Labour colleagues, who voted against the war. But none of us, Mr Speaker, should take any satisfaction from this report. Instead, all of us, I believe, I believe, can't have, order, we can't have a running commentary on the statements made from the front bench. Members of this House know me well enough to know that I will allow all opinions to be expressed and if that means the Prime Minister has to be here for quite a long time, he's accustomed to that. But the Right Honourable Gentleman is entitled to be heard with courtesy. If people want to witter away, leave the chamber. It's boring and we don't need you. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We have to be saddened at what has been revealed and we must now reflect on that. In addition to all those British service people and Iraqi civilians and combatants who lost their lives in the conflict, there are many members here who voted to stop the war but have not lived to see themselves vindicated by this report. First and foremost, Mr Speaker, it would do us well to remember Robin Cook, who stood over there 13 years ago and said in a few hundred words, in advance of the tragedy to come, what has been confirmed by this report in more than two million words. The Chilcot report has rightly dug deep into the litany of failures of planning for the occupation, the calamitous decision to stand down the Iraqi army and to dissolve the entire Iraqi state as a process of debathification. But the reality is, it was the original decision to follow the US president into this war in the most volatile region in the world and impose a colonial style occupation that led to every other disaster. The government's uh, September 2002 dossier with its claim declaring that uh, Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction that could be deployed in 45 minutes was only the most notorious of many deceptions. As Major General Michael Lorry told the inquiry, and I quote, we knew at the time that the purpose of the dossier was precisely to make the case for war rather than setting out the available intelligence. Military action in Iraq not only turned a humanitarian crisis into a disaster, it also convulsed the entire region, just as intervention in Libya in 2011 has sadly left the country in the grip of warring militias and terror groups. And the Iraq war actually increased the threat of terrorism in our own country, as Baroness Manningham Buller, former head of MI5, made clear to the inquiry. There are many lessons that need to be drawn from the Iraq war and the investigation carried out by Sir John Chilcott and his inquiry for our government, our country, this parliament, as well as my party and indeed every other party. They include the need for a more open and independent relationship with the United States and for a foreign policy based on upholding international law and the authority of the United Nations, which always seeks peaceful solutions to international disputes. We also need, and the Prime Minister indicated this, much stronger oversight of the security and intelligence services, full restoration of proper cabinet government and give Parliament the decisive say over any future decisions to go to war, based on objective information, not just through government discretion, but through a War Powers Act that I hope this Parliament will pass. And as in the wake of Iraq, our own and other Western governments increasingly resort to hybrid warfare based on the use of drones and special forces, our democracy, and our democracy is crucial and important, needs to ensure that their use is subject to proper parliamentary <coughs> scrutiny. There are no more important decisions a Member of Parliament ever gets asked to make than those relating to peace and war. The very least that Members of Parliament in the country should be able to expect is rigorous and objective evidence on which to base their crucial decisions. We now know that the House was misled in the run-up to the war and the House must now decide how it should deal with it 13 years later. Just as all those who took 
the decisions laid bare in the Chilcot report must face up to the consequences of their actions, whatever they may be. Later today, I'll be meeting a group of families of military servicemen and women who lost loved ones, Iraq war veterans and Iraqi citizens who've lost family members as a result of the war that the US and British governments launched in 2003. I'll be discussing with them, our public and the Iraqi people, the decisions taken by our then government that led the country into war with the terrible consequences. Quite bluntly, Mr Speaker, there are huge lessons for every single one of us here today. We make decisions that have consequences that don't just go on for the immediate years, they go on for decades and decades afterwards. We need to reflect very seriously before we take any decisions, again, to take military action without realising the consequences of those will live with all of us for many decades to come and have often incalculable consequences as a result. Yeah.